This is the introductory video for the Physics 1101-1120 Resonance of a String Practice Lab. So what we're going to be studying in this week's experiment is a string that has been suspended between two points. On one end we've got a mechanical arm which is going to vibrate the string up and down, and on the other end, where you can't see it, the string has been suspended over a pulley and there's a mass on the end of it. So the string has been suspended between these two points under tension, and as I said, this arm here is vibrating one end of the string, which is why it looks like this. Now what happens is th this vibrating arm causes a wave to travel down the string in this direction, and then it bounces off the pulley at the end and comes back in this direction. Now for most frequencies, the wave headed in this direction and the wave headed in this direction just interfere with each other and you get sort of a jumbled pattern. However, for certain frequencies, the wave headed this way and the wave headed this way interfere constructively, which means that their peaks and their troughs all happen at the same locations, and instead of getting a jumbled mess, you instead get these very nice patterns. So in this case, you can see there's certain places where the string is vibrating quite a lot, and other places where the string is not vibrating at all. So the places where it's vibrating a lot are called antinodes, and the places where it's still are called nodes. These are called resonance patterns, and we're going to study several of these for this experiment. Now I'm going to turn off the frequency generator right here, just so that you can see that yes, that is an ordinary string, and I'm going to teach you how to use this guy to begin with. So first of all, this is what sets how fast this arm is oscillating up and down. The on-off switch is up here at the top, it's a little hard to see, so you turn it on there, and this will automatically set itself to 100 Hz, which is actually way too high for our purposes, so we're going to turn this down in just a second. First, however, make sure that your amplitude knob is only set to about one-third of the maximum. So the amplitude sets how powerful the oscillation up and down is, and if it's too powerful it'll start slapping the table, so about one-third of the maximum is about right for you. So now I'm going to turn the frequency down to the minimum. There's two knobs here, by the way, to do this. One of them adjusts the frequency by 1 Hz at a time, and the other one is fine adjust. It adjusts it by 0.1 Hz every time. So I'm going to use the course adjust to begin with, and I'm going to go right down to 1 Hz, in fact, and you'll now see that that arm is going up and down very slowly. In fact, it's going up and down one time per second, which is 1 Hz. So I can turn this up, and it'll oscillate faster. Now to begin with, your manual tells you to go looking for the fifth harmonic. That means that we're going to see five of those antinodes on our string. So you just start turning up your frequency until you start seeing patterns. Now you may notice that sometimes this is kind of noisy. Generally if it's making a lot of noise, it means you're not quite at the right frequency yet. So I'll keep adjusting this. And now you see that I have a resonance pattern on my string meaning that I've got these anti-nodes and these nodes. However, there's only four of these on my string right now. Obviously, you can't see that. So that means I'm at too low a frequency. I want to go up more to find the fifth harmonic, which means I'll have five of these loops instead of just four. So I'll turn up a little more. And now I can see I've got five of these resonances, so five of these loops on my string. However, I'm not quite done yet because I want this pattern to be as big as possible while at the same time looking as stable as possible. So I'm going to adjust the fine adjust now to try and get the pattern looking as big as it can be without it starting to shake around. So I'm going to do that now. I'll turn this up by 0.1 Hz using the fine adjust knob, and what you should see is that this pattern got a little bit bigger. So I'll turn it back down, and you can see that yes, the pattern got smaller. Turn it back up by 0.1, it got bigger and I'm just going to keep going until I see the pattern starting to get smaller again. So I go up by one more, and again this got a little bit bigger, and I'll go up by one more, and here's something you'll notice is it got a little bit bigger, but if we just watch for a while we're going to see this node start to get a little bit wobbly, and over time it just gets worse and worse. So if you see something like that it means you've gone a little too far, so even though the pattern got bigger, if this pattern's not stable, that is if the nodes aren't still, that means you've gone too far. So I'm going to turn it back down again, and you'll see that in a few seconds the node settles down again. So I'm going to use this as my frequency, because this is as big as the pattern gets without the pattern also starting to get unstable. So it's a bit of a judgment call. You want these anti-nodes to look as big as possible, but at the same time you want your nodes to stay nice and steady and still. 
So this would be the frequency that I record in my book. And by the way, your frequencies may be similar to this, but not exactly the same because you might have a different weight at the end of your string. So I would write this down, and I also want to write down what my uncertainty is. We're definitely going to have a source of instrument uncertainty due to the frequency generator. This is listed in the apparatus section of your lab manual, so you can go and look up what the instrument uncertainty of this device is. Generally speaking, you won't have any physical uncertainty, but it is a possibility, so I'll just point out in what circumstances you would add some physical uncertainty. If you can move the fine adjust of the frequency by a certain amount and not see any difference in your pattern, that is, it looks no bigger or smaller, it looks no more or less unstable, if that's the case, then you might want to add some physical uncertainty. So if, for example, I could move this by 0.1 and the pattern looked exactly the same, no differences, then I'd probably want to use half of 0.1 as my physical uncertainty and add that to my instrument uncertainty. But like I said, most of you won't see that. Most of you will find that if you change this by 0.1, the pattern definitely looks different. So you only add the physical uncertainty if you can make a change and see no difference in the pattern. Now once you've found this frequency where the fifth harmonic looks as big as possible and as stable as possible, the manual asks you to sketch the pattern in your book, so all five of those antinodes sketch them and record your frequency and its uncertainty. And then you're going to do that for the fourth, the third, the second, and the first harmonics also. So that means you're going to reduce your frequency until you find the fourth harmonic. And remember, these things are generally only noisy when you're not quite at the right frequency. Now, when you get to the right frequency, it should be fairly quiet. And again, you would play around with your fine adjust to make this pattern as big as possible. So you could go up one and say, okay, the pattern got a little smaller there. Go back down, that's where it looks big. Go one more, pattern got small again and a little bit noisy. So I'll go back up one and this is where the, my pattern looked as big as possible while at the same time being as stable as possible. So once I found this for the fourth harmonic, that means four of these antinodes on my string, then again I'm going to sketch the pattern in my book, record my frequency and its uncertainty, and then I'd go down and do it for the third one as well. So you'll be doing this for the first five harmonics. You start at the fifth one, go down to the fourth, then to the third, then to the second, then to the first. And in every case, you'll sketch the pattern, record the frequency that gave you that pattern with an uncertainty. And then you're ready to move on to the next step. Now in the next part of the experiment, they ask you to go back to the fourth harmonic. So I'll go do that now. So I'll adjust my frequency to the value that gave me the biggest pattern for the fourth harmonic. And now I'm going to adjust my camera angle just a little bit so that you can see more of the nodes on this string. So now you can see two of them, or rather three, because the one at the end here does count as well. So the nodes are the still places in the pattern, and we also have a node at each end of the string, so at the pulley end and at the mechanical arm end. Our job in this next part of the experiment is to measure the distance between the nodes. Now to help you do that, on your desk you're going to have some paper underneath this string, so let me demonstrate. So something like that. That makes it a little hard to see in the video where the string is, but I'll show you what you do with this. What you want to do is mark on the piece of paper the location of your nodes. So try and do this as accurately as possible. Estimate where the exact center of your node is, and then you're going to mark that on your piece of paper. And remember to do it at the ends of the string as well. So you want to do this for all of your nodes. And because you have four anti-nodes on the string, there should be five nodes that you mark off on your piece of paper. Then you're going to measure the distance between these, either with a ruler or with a tape measure. So the manual asks you to put this all in a table, so you'd put your four internodal distances in a table, and you also want to write down an uncertainty for all of them. Now this takes a little bit of thought. So we assume that the instrument uncertainty of a ruler is negligible. In other words, we're assuming that the manufacturer did a good job of making an accurate ruler, and our other sources of uncertainty are going to be much larger than that. So we can use zero as our instrument uncertainty, but we will have reading uncertainty due to our eyeballs reading the ruler itself. And remember, it's about a quarter millimeter on both ends of the ruler. So when you're taking a measurement of your internodal distance from here to here, 
Remember, you're going to have about a quarter millimeter of reading uncertainty on this end and another quarter millimeter of reading uncertainty on this end. However, we also have a significant source of physical uncertainty, and that is that we have to estimate where the center of the node actually is. So what I recommend you do is go in there and make a judgment call on how wide you think the area where the center could be is. So maybe I'd say to myself, I think this node's about a centimeter wide, and then use plus or minus half of that range as your uncertainty. So if I think the node is a centimeter wide, I could use plus or minus half a centimeter as my physical uncertainty on this end of the measurement and then I'd probably have a very similar value on this end of the measurement due to figuring out where the center of this node is. Keep in mind that the nodes at the very ends of the string, so at the mechanical arm end and at the pulley end, those nodes might need more physical uncertainty because it might be harder for you to figure out where the exact center of the node is. So your table will have your four internodal distances and it's possible that they won't all have the same uncertainty because the ones at the end might have a larger physical uncertainty than the ones in the middle. And remember, in your lab book, you should also explain your uncertainty choices. So write your table down, write your values and your uncertainties, and then explain in words to your lab instructor why you chose the uncertainties that you did. So explain how much physical uncertainty and how much reading uncertainty you had, and from what sources. The next thing that the manual asks you to record is your string density. This is actually given to you, so it's in the apparatus section of your lab manual. So you'd go and look it up and record it in your book, with its uncertainty and its units. Because you're given this value, you don't need to explain where the uncertainty comes from. Next, the manual asks you to measure the mass that's dangling off the end of your string. So you turn off your frequency generator, and you go and fetch the mass that is at the end of the string. And you're going to go and weigh this on the electronic balances that are on the side counter. Now because you're taking a measurement, you'll want to write an uncertainty down with it. So you should have some instrument uncertainty due to the electronic balance itself, and as usual, you can find that in the apparatus section of your lab manual. Will you have any reading uncertainty due to reading the digital scale on the electronic balance? And is there anything about this measurement that would give you some physical uncertainty? So think carefully about that, write down your value, and write down your explanation for why you chose the uncertainty that you did. The last thing that the manual asks you to write down is the frequency that gave you this fourth harmonic, so the frequency you got before. So you've already measured this and you've already thought about the uncertainty, but you write it down again, write down its uncertainty, and explain your choice for why you chose that uncertainty value. So did you have an instrument uncertainty due to the device? Did you have any reading uncertainty due to reading this digital scale? And did you have any physical uncertainty due to getting the fourth harmonic exactly? So that's the end of the data taking. You will be doing some calculations with this data, however, and your lab instructor will show you how to propagate uncertainties through your calculations using this data. You'll also learn how to round things off to the correct significant figures. And in week two of this experiment, your lab instructor will show you how to use Excel to do calculations and how to write up a typed report.